All right, well, I see that nobody brought kids this week, which is good. Um, I, as I, uh, oh, okay. Well, um, I, I, just, I just wanted to remind you that last week I warned everyone that this year we would be dealing with mature material um, because that's the nature of the Old Testament. If you have ever taught the entire Old Testament, and particularly parts of it, to a children's Sunday school class or to a youth group, and have never received a complaint from parents, then you are teaching it wrong. Um, because when it comes right down to it, the Old Testament is about real life. And as we all know, real life is, uh, is messy, it is dangerous, it is sometimes offensive, uh, and it is, always, uh, it is always challenging. That being said, we have a real God who oversees our real life, and we and what we study, we con we study in the context of His providence. So, let's let's just move on and and with all that in the background. Here's my my framing, my operational question this morning: How serious is God about sin? How serious is God about sin? In Genesis chapter 18, we read that God, accompanied by two mysterious companions paid Abraham a special visit in a grove of oak trees at a place called Mamre. Now, this is important on a couple of levels. One of the things that, that as we study the Old Testament, we begin to see time and time again is that God shows up in different ways. Sometimes he shows up in the clouds and the fire, the smoke around, say, for example, Mount Sinai. Uh, sometimes he speaks through the still, soft voice. He speaks to, the, he speaks to Isaiah in the temple through a vision and a cloud. But there are some times in the Old Testament when he shows up in kind of a personal form, reminiscent almost of the incarnation. We call these, or theologians have called these, Christophanies. And this is one of those times that, that when, and, and it kind of depends on your definition of, of the second person of the Trinity. Is, is, is Christ any physical manifestation of God present, meaning human, I should say, not physical human manifestation of God in, uh, in our world. Um, it, it, that's sort of a, one of those angels on the head of the pen type of debates when you get into that. What we want to understand, though, is that, that many scholars have thought of this appearance of God in the tent with these two angels as a, a Christophany. That is, this is a pre-incarnation, meaning pre-New Testament uh, visitation of Christ. When we understand the Trinity properly, that doesn't throw us off base in any way. But we understand that, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, God, Father, and Holy Spirit. And so we, you know, we ask ourselves, is this one of those times like the appearance of the commander of the armies of the Lord in Joshua, as, with, uh, as in other uh, times in the Old Testament, um, as in, the, say, for example, the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel? Um, but again, one of those, this, this is one of those things that if you want to pursue it, it's a great topic for, for deeper biblical study. But I want to focus on the location of this meeting for just a second. I think it's fascinating that it takes place in this place called Mamre. Now, if you'll remember from past readings, Mamre was, it was this place where, it was a place where Abraham settled, Abram settled, it was a place where he built altars, he built an altar. But what was it before that? Mamre was this great oak grove, and I think you all you know, understand that. In Texas, you, we've got such beautiful oak trees. But it was this beautiful oak grove that had become a pagan holy place. It was, if you think about it, like a, a, a druidic type of temple for Northern Europe, an outside place of worship. Mamre had become a, a pagan holy place. It was a place of idols. It was a place of unholy sacrifice and worship. It was a place of many practices that were offensive to God. It was a place that had been profaned by pagan cults. And yet there, Abram planted a flag for God. That's where he built an altar. I love the fact that he didn't look around. He didn't look at this spot and say, yes, it's beautiful, or yes, it's desecrated, or yes. He looked at it and said, this is the place where we are going to plant the flag of the Lord our God in the middle of all of this. And I think that's important for us to remember as contemporary Christians that we are, 
We are not called to go find a special enclave somewhere else out of the sight of the world. We're called to plant the flag of Jesus Christ, to raise the cross of Jesus Christ right here in the middle of everything, right where we are. And so that's, that's one of the things I love about the, the physical location of this church. We are, we are here to lift up Jesus Christ right where we are in the center of San Antonio. And so as we think about that, Think about Jesus plant. Uh, not excuse me. Think about Abraham planting the flag of the one true God in this pl- pagan holy place, and it was there that God met him. In that meeting, God spoke at length to Abraham about his promise to give him a son by Sarah. We talked about this last uh, couple weeks ago, but in this meeting, God also told Abraham that he had some grave, some fell business to which he must attend. He said. Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. You know, time and time again, the Bible tells us that God hears the painful screams and the suffering of his people and his creation. Now, this is what God told Moses at the burning bush. The prophets talk about it over and over again. And even in Revelation, John tells us that God hears the voices of the, of the martyrs who have suffered for Christ because they are under his throne. They, they, they're, in a sense, holding up or, or beneath his throne. And so he hears the, their cries constantly. And so... As I thought about the, the fact that God hears the outcries of the people, I think, what must God be hearing now? You know, over the last decade, it seems especially, we have been in, in a time of, of, I would say, increasing, um, increasing religious persecution and increasing Christian persecution. I, it, it struck me, I guess, really about 10 years ago when ISIS really came onto the scene, when when their atrocities started to draw attention to persecution that was going on, persecution of Christians that was going on around the world in places like in China, in North Korea, in Nigeria, in Pakistan. You know, one of the things that really kind of created some tension in me was all the celebration of the two Koreas coming together in the Olympics. And I think it's wonderful. I hope that, in fact, that peninsula is moving towards a place of peace. But we have to remember what's happening on the other side of that, of that DMZ. We have to remember that that, that, is, that is a place of autocratic control. And it is not a place friendly to the gospel or to Christians. In, this, in the hour that we are sitting here today, statistically 12 Christians somewhere in the world will die an unnatural death because they have stood up for Christ in one way or another. Um, the last time I remember hearing somebody say that was when Ron Skates was preaching one morning, and at that very hour, the Sutherland Springs shooting was taking place. We are never as far away from persecution as we think we are. And even culturally, we have seen Christianity marginalized and mocked in countries like our own. We see it, we hear it mocked on talk shows, we hear it mocked in political circles, we hear it mocked in all types of ways. As businesses are shut down, Jesus Christ is openly mocked in movies, and it, it, it's very sad that we see it just becoming a casual thing in many, in many uh, genres. And whether it's racial injustice, from racial injustice to violence in our churches and schools, from Parkland, Florida to Sutherland Springs, to the silent cry of millions of unborn babies, and the brokenness of families, from the abuse of creation, whether it's the abuse of the environment or the abuse of sexuality, God is hearing the outcries of creation. So God cannot turn a blind eye to the sin committed against his children. And he cannot turn a blind eye to the sin committed against himself. Think about this. What if someone was bullying or abusing one of your children? And it was reported to the teacher, and the teacher said, oh, it's really no big deal. How would you feel about that? Or what if someone desecrated or perverted things that you had made or was telling lies about you, dragging your name through the mud? 
people said, oh, you know what, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. What if you were the victim of slander or gossip and that affected your relationships, your job, your all of those things? You couldn't just sit idly by if people said, oh, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. I mean, the old, there's, a, there's a sad myth that's gone around for generations. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Try saying that in the age of Twitter. It's just totally untrue. But when we think about it, all of us, all of us in this room have hurt God's other children out of selfishness at one time or another. All of us have turned a blind eye to neglect. Should God say, ah, it's no big deal. Those other people, don't worry about them. Or, you know, all of us at some point have indulged in aspects of a culture or put up with aspects of our culture that mock the worship of the living God. Should we tell God, hey, you know what, just get over it? You know, when we put sin in those terms, we have to remember that there is no such thing as a victimless sin. Obviously, when we sin against other people, we insult the dignity or do injury to that person. But sin is also an affront to God's honor and creation. And if we believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to God, no one comes to the Father except through him, if we allow lies about Jesus Christ to stand or perversions of his image or desecrations of his name, his holiness to stand, what does that do? Well, that, that lets people think that, oh, well, God's no big deal. Jesus Christ is no big deal. And instead of walking down the narrow path that leads to life, they jump on the broad way that's easy and steadily slopes, as C.S. Lewis says, steadily slopes easily down into the bowels of hell without anybody noticing. So God cannot allow casual indifference to his name, callous ingratitude, or calamitous disrespect. Because even spiritual sin, even what people think of as private sin, is an affront to God. As a matter of fact, the reason I chose that psalm this morning, this is my father's world, I mean, that's, a, that's an amplification of Genesis 1-1, which I, you'll hear me say, I believe is the most important verse in the whole Bible. Because if, you know, if Genesis 1-1, if God did not in fact create the heavens and the earth is not true, then where does God have any claim to judge us, to guide us, to tell us, to rule us, or anything like that? Our, the basis of our faith is not simply that Jesus loves us, and he does. But the reason he loves us is because God created us. And so we belong to him. I'm not self-existent. I did not create myself. I did not, I am not autonomous. I, you know, I am not the one who owns my life. I was made by God with a purpose. As the Heidelberg Catechism says, we belong in life and in death to God. And so, you know, this, yes, this is my body in the sense that God has given me stewardship over it, but it is not mine to abuse or use or, or do anything according or outside of his purposes. And part of the problem is we, we think, well, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I do things myself. You're not the boss of me. But the truth is God is the boss of us. He is the creator of us. And so all of these things matter. And the spiritual, the literal outcry of Sodom's sin had become so great that it reached heaven. So what was Sodom's sin? Well, before this incident, it didn't have a name. But ever since, the sin, ever since that time, the sin of Sodom has been called sodomy, the unnatural act of sex between per two persons of the same gender. Now, that's not the only thing that was going on in Sodom. But without getting any more explicit, the very name of Sodom became a byword for wickedness manifest in sexual perversion throughout history. It's condemned throughout Scripture. In Leviticus, God says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. How serious is it? God calls it an abomination. I remember talking with a, a friend in, in Charlotte when I was a pastor there. And he said, he said, I don't see where God really has anything negative to say about it. I said, you mean other than when he calls it an abomination? <laughs> you know, he lists it, God, you know, the Bible lists it right there with incest. You know, sex with, with your own child and bestiality. God considers 
this sin, this sexual perversion, very serious. But the sin of sodomy did not stand alone. I think as, as an amplifier, as a force multiplier, the sodomites were guilty of conversion, or excuse me, coercion in wickedness. We read in this story, as you all have read for today, when God's agents entered the city, Abraham's nephew Lot tried to hide them in his home to protect them from the sodomites. But the men of the city found out th about the visitors and demanded, bring them out to us that we may know them. Now, as we have shown before, in the Bible, the expression to know is a euphemism for sex. The Bible, or excuse me, the mob was demanding that Lot turn them over for gang rape. And if they wouldn't come out willingly, they were going to come in and get them. They were going to be forced. They must go along or die. It reminds me of the ultimatum that, that ISIS would give its captives, its Christian victims. You either convert or die. And to, young women, to women and young girls, you either become a sex slave or die. And the sodomites were also guilty not only of coercion in wickedness, but of complicity in wickedness. Listen to this. Genesis says that the men of Sodom, both young and old, listen to this, all the people to the last man, that's everybody in town. I don't know if it includes dogs and stuff, but it's everybody in the city. Everyone was involved. The whole city accepted and expected this. This is, they didn't use the term here, but this is the, the literal, you know, sort of, identification of the original lynch mob it's it's everybody came out to turn it turned out to come see this everybody came to cheer everybody came to participate or to at least egg it on everyone came out to participate or at least to see the show and it was like falling into a school of piranhas now this reminds me of of the recent reports of of spring breakers down in places like fort lauderdale and, and panama city students actually violating each other on the beach with people watching and videoing it and posting it on the internet. I mean, if you're not aware of this, praise the Lord. But it is, it is out there. It is scary. All the people of Sodom, both young and old, came to Lot's house and demanded that he hand the men over to them to be abused. In desperation, Lot made a despicable choice. Lot offered his daughters instead. He thought that the only way to protect his guests was to surrender his own daughters to the mob. Now it's clear that Lot was more concerned about what God might do to him if his agents got hurt than he was about his daughter's welfare. Sadly, the episode is a commentary on the culture of the age. In those days, and sadly, even until recently, and even in a lot of the parts of the world now, girl children and women in general are considered expendable. They're considered property. And as we see in this case, they're considered disposable. And sadly, we see that kind of thinking, this treatment of women, all around the world to this day, in parts of the world where the most radical versions of, of Sharia law are in place, in, in parts of Asia, here in our own country with the human trafficking problem that we have. Women are property. Women are things. Women are disposable. Sadly, that is one of those things that we still have not worked through, even as our culture, all the way. You know, there's a despicable and interesting parallel story in the book of Judges in which a father does much the same thing by offering his daughter and a comp concubine to appease an angry mob. It's in Judges in chapter 19. And even though there's not any specific comment given in the Lot story, in the Judges story, it's given as an illustration of the depth of depravity to which Israel had fallen during the time of the Judges. In that time in which the, the, the writer of Scripture says that, everyone, that there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Does that sound remotely familiar? So it's, a, it's one of those stories that, that comes up again, like the story of Abimelech, once again reinforcing what happened with Pharaoh in Egypt. But the spectators were just as guilty as the sodomizers. 
because they went along and they said, it's okay. What's the big deal? Get over it. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 32, the Apostle Paul says that those who give approval to such things deserve the same condemnation as those who practice them. Not they are guilty of a sin as well. They deserve the same condemnation. And so for these abominations, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But then something interesting happened. When God told Abraham what he intended to do, Abraham stood up and begged that God would save any innocent or righteous people that might be there. He was horrified at the idea that, that the innocent might be swept away in the tide of God's judgment. And he pleaded, far be it from you, far be it from you, O Lord, to do such a thing to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. What if there are 50 decent people left in the city? Will you lump the good with the bad and get rid of the lot? Wouldn't you spare the city for the sake of those 50 innocents? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. There's a tiny fraction for the, for the sake of the whole. And then, as though he had, had the right to haggle with the Lord of the universe, Abraham boldly prays, well, well, if you'll save the city for the sake of 50 righteous people, how about 45? Because really, we've agreed in principle that you'll save the city but, so now we're just haggling about price. You know, if, if, how, about 40, how about 45? How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? Again, a tiny percentage. He'll save thousands. He's willing to be merciful for the whole city for the sake of a righteous few if he only finds them there. And one thing we need to make sure we understand, he's, he's judging the sodomites, the people of the city. People say, well, you know, well, he found four. Was, was five the cutoff number? Because Lot, you know, Lot and his family are brought out. Lot and his family are not sodomites. They are not, I mean, even they're, they're, they're sort of resident aliens, if you will. But we'll cover that a little bit more in a second. But when God's agents arrived in Sodom, there were no righteous sodomites to be found. I want you to just think about that for a second. Nobody. From the oldest of the old to the youngest of the young, nobody there was righteous. All of the people of Sodom were guilty. And so God executed his judgment on Sodom, on everyone but Abraham's, ne Abraham's nephew Lot and his family. Incidentally, this was the one family that showed kindness and mercy and decency to God's servants. At first, he struck the inhabitants of the city blind so that they were overcome by fear. And Lot and his family could make their escape. And then the Lord firebombs the cities. Literal fire and brimstone. A 100% inferno of destruction. He did not kill them quietly. He did not kill them in a way that nobody would notice. God made an example of them. His judgment was not just punishment. It was a warning. This Holocaust was so awful that the news of their doom traveled like a wave to all the world and echoes like a sonic boom through history so that the very names of Sodom and Gomorrah are not only synonymous with sexual perversion but also with the very wrath of God. This happened so long ago that we almost think about it in terms of a mythology, like like. Okay, I believe that the Bible happened, but it happened so long ago that it, you know, it's, it's like the, the fall of Troy. I mean, I know it happened, but, you know, that, what does that have to do with me? But think about if you had lived in, in some other town. Think if you'd lived in, in Egypt, or think if you'd lived in Ur, and the word came that, that these cities had been completely wiped off the face of the earth by fire and brimstone by the wrath of this Hebrew God. That would have been terrifying. And that was a story, that was a, an event that made an impression throughout history. But let's take it down from the, from the macro level to the micro level for a second. Let's talk about Lot. Over the course of the past few chapters, we've, we've touched on the story of Lot. We've followed Lot's story as part of Abraham's story. 
At first, we see that he was so successful, so prosperous, that there just wasn't enough room for he and Abraham to live in the same place. They couldn't live together. They just, their, their enterprises had become too big. And when they separated, Lot chose the most promising-looking place to live. Sadly, however, it was just on the edge of the promised land, if not already outside of it. What's more, he swiftly went from living near Sodom, that's what Genesis 13, 12 says, to living in Sodom, Genesis 14, 12, one chapter later. As a result, he needed to be rescued by Abraham when a foreign army carried off the inhabitants of Sodom. But Lot still didn't learn his lesson. He apparently assimilated even further and gained a position of authority and standing in the community because the Bible tells us in 19.1 that he was sitting at the gate. That, uh, he's not just hanging around at the door of the city. That's where the leaders of the city met. That was a, that, that's city hall, if you will, in a town like that. And so he was obviously becoming an influential person, perhaps as, a, perhaps as an immigrant businessman or becoming more deeply involved. We see that he, he actually had come to regard the Sodomites as his friends in 1907. He owned a house there. His daughters were engaged to be married from men of Sod, to men of, from Sodom. Lot had become a settled man of substance, and yet compromises must have been made to mark his rise in that community. You can't live comfortably in a place of, like Sodom, in a place of such wickedness, without making quite a few compromises along the way. But even while he compromised, the spark of his faith was not utterly extinguished. He's still called righteous in the New Testament. Why? Because at least he was grieved over the wickedness around him. Now, to me, that sounds a little thin. It sounds a little familiar, too, but it sounds a little thin. You know, it's like, this is a terrible, evil, rotten place. And I feel really bad about it. But I'm still willing to work for the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> you know, come to Sodom. You know, maybe you'll get mugged and beaten to death. But come anyway, spend your money here. At some point, he's compromised. And he's, made, he's, he's done pretty well in the process. But he did grieve over the wickedness around him. And the Apostle Peter describes Lot as a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Unfortunately, he wasn't tormented enough to leave. Now, Lot never totally identified with the world in which he lived. Yet at the same time, he was unwilling to leave it behind. He was, as Derek Kidner calls him, the righteous man without a pilgrim spirit. How many of us are like that? We're Christians, yes, but we also want to have our part of the world. We have to have a slice of the action. We feel that we can't possibly give it up completely. That would simply be too great a cost to bear. And so like Lot, we seek instead to do our best to be in a hopelessly compromised situation, trying to maintain a dual citizenship in the world and in heaven. You know, and that's a difficult challenge for us because we are to be in the world but not of the world. We are supposed to be planting our flag in the middle of the Oaks of Monterey. How do we do that? How do we do that without, without compromising ourselves? How often does that happen to you? How often does that happen to me? Where you find yourself in an impossible dilemma because you feel like the only way I can survive is to go along and get along sometimes. Here's the problem. Sin is like Lay's potato chips. You can't do it just once. You can't have just one. And when you start making compromises with sin, those compromises have a way of catching up with you. It complicates everything and puts you into some pretty untenable situations. And too late, you say to yourself, you know what? I'm, too, I'm in too deep. How do I get out of this? How do I get myself out? Unfortunately, by the time that Lot realized his danger, that he was in too deep, he couldn't get himself out. You know, I think about it like it's like a guy who's gotten involved with the mafia. Once you're in, they don't just let you go. If you're in a gang, they don't just let you go. If you're in certain social circles, you know, as long as you go along and get along, that's fine. But as, long as, long, as soon as you stick your, uh, stick your head up or as long as you stick your neck out or as long if you ever say, you know, I just, you know, I just can't go along with what you guys are doing, you don't, you don't just leave. I mean, your reputation is trashed, you're slandered. There are all kinds of things that can happen. And we all know examples of that from 
you know, from high society to low society. And so, you know, once you're in deep, it gets pretty hard to leave. You know, our, whole, our schemes to hold on to that piece of the world entangle us in ways that we never thought they would. What's sad is that Lot tried to get his family out. He even pleaded with his sons-in-law to come with him. But even his last-minute desperate appeal in the dead of night would not convince them. Apparently, he hadn't talked to them much before about the holiness of God. For them, maybe this was the first time they'd really ever considered. Maybe they'd never, you know, here they'd lived in the house of a person of faith, and they'd never heard the truth of God. It's not enough simply to live by example. We have to be salt and light. We think that if we just live good lives, people will pick it up on their own. That is not what the Bible tells us. And in spite of the angel's warning, Lot's, uh, Lot's wife still couldn't leave completely. And what happened as she was leaving? She looked back. You know, only four people survived this Holocaust, and one disobeyed the angel's command to look back because she just couldn't let it go all the way. And let's not judge Lot's wife too harshly. I mean, how many of us would not be tempted to look back? How many of us have come out of a difficult situation and not looked back? So we have to ask ourselves, was Lot at least reformed? by his brush with God's wrath? Sadly, no. Apparently, you can take Lot and his daughters out of Sodom, but it's a lot harder to take the Sodom out of Lot and his daughters. <laughs> Living alone with his daughters hardly led to repentance and righteousness. Because we read in the next episode, in case the first part of this story is not creepy enough, <laughs> it's clear that Lot's daughters had been negatively influenced deeply by their time in Sodom. As with Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 16, they were unwilling to leave their future in God's hands. And so, there was, to them, there was something more important than, than obeying God. They wanted children, and they were willing to do whatever it took to achieve that goal. So Genesis tells us, now Lot lived in a cave with his two daughters, and they said, our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into, to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Just think about that. They're saying there is literally no other man on earth other than our father. They weren't even living that far from these other cities. And they're saying, there's, just, there's no one left on earth. We're going to have to go into him. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. It's, isn't that funny how they claim sort of a high, not noble purpose? We want to go in. We want to... We want to, to Get our father, get our father drunk. We want to, we want to lie with him, for his sake, <laughs> so that so that he will have grandchildren. Isn't that thoughtful? <laughs> and yeah, how nice. Yeah, it's wonderful. And thus, that's good, summarizing. And thus, both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn, uh, the firstborn bore a son, and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. God spared Lot and his daughters from wrath, only to have them repopulate the same territory with the children of another perversion, incest. The two children produced by this incest became the progenitors of the Moabites and the, Am and the Ammonites, two wickedly pagan tribes that Israel would fight constantly after the exodus. Even though God had purged Sodom and Gomorrah by fire, the spirit of Sodom, the, the ethos of Sodom, the, the sort of the habits and values of Sodom and Gomorrah lived on through Lot's daughters and their sons. They had grown up among the Sodomites and probably passed what they had learned to their sons. It's so sad. Because Lot's, Lot's idol was wealth and comfort, and so he chose the security and prosperity of Sodom over the promised land. Ironically, the story ends with him living in a cave, destitute and broken. What is particularly striking and tragic is that neither Lot nor his daughters thought to return to Abraham, or at least if they thought about it, they didn't do it. 
The problem of Lot's prosperity had been radically dissolved by God. Like the prodigal son, he now had literally nothing to stand in the way of his returning home. The angels directed him to flee to the plain and return to the mountains. What is the mountains? I mean, the mountains always come up in Scripture. The mountains are the place where you go in times of trouble. The mountains are the place where God lives. Um, the angel said that they should go back there, the place where, from which Abraham looked, to see, looked down to see the judgment of God unfold on Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet even then, when deprived of everything, he still was not willing to return in repentance to the way of God. And so he ended his days in misery and depravity, a sorry shell of what he once was. Now, as we step away from the story and think about how we might apply it to our own situations, this story is not just about how God dealt with one particular group of particularly bad people. It's not just about how God dealt with one particular sin or set of sins in another time and place. This story is about God's attitude toward evil. The Apostle Peter wrote that God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. He condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. That's 2 Peter 2.6. Again, God did this to, to send a warning to the rest of humanity. In this story, we learn about God's judgment. Judgment is suspended until the righteous are safe. But then the axe falls, and there's no room for complacency. The Lord waits so long in his graciousness that people start to begin that he will not judge, that he cannot judge. But then when he comes in judgment, it is so decisive that it seems as though God is merciless. But this is not the sudden, arbitrary anger of an irritable temper or, or a capricious God, easily inflamed and then equally easily pacified. What we see in this story, beginning in the tent in Mamre, is a, del is a deliberate, measured execution of wrath, following, incidentally, a full investigation of the facts. I'm going to send my agents there. They're going to go and see if this outcry, I mean, it's not as though God didn't know what was going on, but he wanted to show Abraham, I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go make sure, trust but verify. I'm going to go down and check it out. And what happened? As soon as they got there, they were assaulted by a mob who wanted to, who wanted to do terrible things to them. So this was no last-minute judgment, and there can be no last-minute appeals or reprieves because there is no higher court to whom an appeal can be made. There are no pertinent facts that have been overlooked in reaching this verdict. And so, Sodom and Gomorrah become an example of God's wrath. And so, it, as it was with Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be at the end of history. In fact, Jesus specifically compares those days to the destruction of Sodom. In Luke 17, 28 through 30, he says, It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. This is how serious God is about sin. God is so serious about sin that he utterly destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and made it a curse. He made it an example. It shows us that God cares about justice, because remember, he wasn't just going down there to punish a group of freewheeling rule breakers. These were rapists. These were oppressors. They were complicit. They were coercive. And before you start taking too much pity on Sodom and Gomorrah, start thinking about their countless victims, all the other people who came to Sodom before the angels and didn't have the power to blind the mob. God cares about those countless victims who cry out to him for help, even if history has forgotten their names. It shows us that God cares about holiness because his character matters and his way matters. His order and his creation matters. As we look at our own world, though, we have to ask, if God cares so much about sin, when is he going to do something about it? 
truth is, he has done something about it. And he's going to do something about it. And here's what he's done. God became man. He became one of us. He became one of us to set humanity free from slavery to sin. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose in victory, he proved that we're not simply victims of our circumstances. Even if we live in Sodom, we don't have to be of the way of Sodom. We don't have to be victims of our circumstances, of our biology, of our impulses, or our culture. We don't have to just go along and get along. We have a choice. By overcoming sin, Jesus gave us the power to say no to sin. No to perversion. No to self-centeredness. No to greed. No to violence. And no to sin in all of its forms. Christ has proven that we do not have to sin or cheat or lie or kill to survive. We don't have to be afraid because even if the world kills us by the resurrection, Jesus proved that God will raise us. He's also given us the Holy Spirit to empower his people to make a difference in people's lives, whether it's the lives of Christians or the lives of people persecuted for their faith in other countries or the lives of the unborn. He has given us the power and authority to act. You may remember a couple years ago a story about uh, a refugee ship coming from Libya to Italy and a group of ISIS radicals had stowed away on the ship and intended on that ship to massacre the, the refugees, mostly Christian refugees who were fleeing what was going on in certain areas of Libya at that time trying to get to the west, trying to, in the case of Italy, trying to get uh, north to Italy to be safe. And what happened was when these ISIS, when these monsters showed themselves and started to attack, started to attack people on the ship, the Christians locked arms and started protecting the other passengers on the ship. Now think about, you know, the power that God, through the Holy Spirit, has given his church to lock arms to be a witness and to stand up against sin. You know, he has given us people. He's given us resources. He has put boots on the ground from Center City, San Antonio, to the Yucatan, from Nigeria to the Middle East. Wherever we are, the presence of God's people can make a difference. We can be salt and light. God has put us here as his advanced team, his vanguard in the world. So then what is God going to do? If that's what he's doing now, what is he going to do? We believe that Christ is coming back. The book of Revelation tells us that just as God heard the outcry of the victims of Sodom and Gomorrah, so God hears the cries and prayers of those who are persecuted and suffer because of their devotion to Christ. Just as he heard the cries of the people of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt, just as he heard the outcries of the people of so or the victims of Sodom. In describing what he saw in his, in his vision of God's judgment on the world and Christ's second coming, the Apostle John wrote, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. God knows that this world is broken. God knows that people are suffering. And so he is coming back to make all things new and to make things the way they are supposed to be. The Apostle Paul wrote, when the Master Jesus appears out of heaven in a blaze of fire with his strong angels, he'll even up the score by settling accounts with those who gave you such a hard time. His coming will be the break we've been waiting for. Those who refuse to know God and refuse to obey the message will pay for what they've done. Eternal exile, to obey, uh, eternal exile from the presence of the master and his splendid power is their sentence. But on that very same day when he comes, he will be exalted by his followers and celebrated by all who believe. This is the promise of God. And if the story of Abraham tells us anything, and if the story of Easter tells us anything, God keeps his promises. God told Abraham, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very great, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. 
God hears the outcry of the persecuted. But here's my question. Where is the outcry of American Christians? There's plenty of outrage. There's no shortage of that. But where's the outcry? Where's the outcry to God? Where are the prayers for the persecuted? Where is our courage? Where are our voices speaking truth to power? Where is the outcry about violence in our schools, in our communities, about prejudice, about racism, about sexual abuse and violence, about pornography, and the sexualization of just about everything? Where is our outcry declaring truth to the nations and to our culture, calling our own church and our own country and our own world to holiness, to peace, and to repentance? Where's the outcry of repentance for our own personal sin? And sin, again, seems so trivial, so antiquated, so irrelevant. But if this story and our headlines tell us anything, it's not. It is that sin is not trivial. It's not antiquated. It's not irrelevant. It kills people, body and soul. We need to get right with God. And here's another aspect. Where are the prayers for our enemies? Where are the prayers for our enemies? That's what I'm going to be preaching about this Sunday. Uh, This Sunday, where are the prayers for our enemies that they would repent and turn to God? Just as Abraham could not be silent, so we must not be silent. Our hope is not that God will destroy, but that he will save. Nineveh, in modern Iraq, was the most wicked, vile city of its age. The people were headed down the same road as the Sodomites. But God sent Jonah to proclaim the word of the Lord to Nineveh. And what happened? The people believed, and the Lord relented, and the city was saved. Paul says that how are people to believe if there's no one to preach? Where are our prayers? And sadly, in the story of Jonah, Jonah went off and sulked because he really wanted to see Nineveh destroyed. But God relented. And God has sent his word to our world again, made flesh in his son, Jesus Christ, and by his Holy Spirit, working through his word and his people. And God commands us to speak the truth in love. And we're here for that reason. As followers of Jesus Christ, we can't stand silent in the face of evil. We can't stand silent in the face of violence and perversion and sin. We cannot pretend to love people by lying to them about what the Bible says, the truth that they can read for themselves in black and white. We're not going to lie to them about God's judgment because God takes his word seriously even when we do not. And the Bible says that God will avenge his people. He will avenge those who are persecuted or coerced. And those who kill God's children will be cast down. God takes this stuff seriously. He takes it so seriously even that he sent his own son to pay for all of our sins and to call us home. The cross is God's supreme testament of how serious he is about sin. The cross shows us just how far God is willing to go, how much he is willing to suffer to prove his love for the world. But the cross also proves that God is gravely serious about sin. On that day, judgment will fall without mercy on the ungodly. God's judgment on sin is grave. It's a matter of life or death. But his love for us is unbreakable. He has given us the way beyond the guilt of our sin. If we accept him and reject the sin he condemns, if we turn around, if we turn to him and say, Jesus, I believe that you can change change my life. I believe that sin, even my sin, is so serious that you died for it. If I say, I know that I've tried to do it on my own, but I just can't do it without you, he will neither reject nor turn you away nor shame you. Because he says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will not be put to shame. Jesus said this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He's not left us without an escape can't do it on our own. It's tempting for us to be arrogant and to think that we are so much better than Lot, but are we really? Are we less compromised than he was? Are we less attached to the things of the world? Which of the players in this story are you more like? 
Are you more like the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, comfortably set in your sins, oblivious to the ticking time bomb of God's judgment? Or are you more like Lot's wife, ultimately unable to give up the world for God? Or are you more like Lot, believing in God, yet compromised and compromising for the sake of something that you want more than God, hardly able to be saved? Or are you more like Abraham, living by faith in God's promises in the midst of this world of much tribulation, looking for God for salvation and trusting him to bring you to the city that is yet to come? As I've wrestled with those questions, I'm not sure which one of those I'm most like. I just know I'm most like Bob. And Bob needs Jesus Christ. For some of the same reasons, but because in every way I know that I need him to reconcile that which I cannot reconcile. And so, there we have it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us this time together. We don't like to be reminded of your wrath, your judgment, but we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we deny the full counsel of your word. Even though we need to understand your truth and, and we need to take sin seriously, help us never to take it more seriously than your grace. Take it more seriously than your mercy. But Lord, your grace will never be amazing to us unless we realize how dangerous our sin is to us. So help us to understand that your truth, your righteousness, your holiness, and your justice is real. And we must understand it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.